Hi everyone, Lucas here. So for those who don't know me, I'm Lucas and I've been teaching English for over 10 years now and also uh, I'm a teacher trainer. And this is my Ask the Expert series, which started on Instagram and now it's on YouTube, okay? In this series, I interview different uh, professionals in the ELT area on various topics. And today's episode, I have a very special guest. I'm really honored to have him with me today. Uh, Paul Salenson, he's going to be talking about uh, the uses of L1 uh, in the teaching and learning process. So that's going to be unmissable. Uh, Paul, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit very quickly? You know, just oh. the most important facts, you know? <laughs> Where shall I begin? <laughs> yeah, okay. I've been teaching for uh, 43 years now, wow. which is longer, which is a hell of a long time. And believe it or not, I still love it, which is the most important thing. And if I were reincarnated, I have a strange feeling I'd probably be a teacher all over again <laughs> oh, so, really? I got so, much, so much joy from teaching across my life because I've been very lucky I've been a I was a native speaker when native speakers were king I had uh, well-paid contracts in various countries I started teaching in Algeria a year then two years in Paris then I had uh, two years in Cairo and then I went to Venezuela for a year did a master's oh. degree in languages well, sorry, in, I can't even remember, in, in English language teaching at Reading University in, in 19, a long time ago, <laughs> 1985. And then, um, then I went to the British Council in Valencia, where I was assistant pedagogical director for five years. We had 2,000 yeah. students and uh, a lot of teachers. And that's where I really learned my craft as a, as a trainer. Okay. Uh, we became a CELTA, a COTI, one of all those things, trainer. Went all around Spain. Um, mm. Then what happened after that? Then uh, I started writing books in 19... Blah, 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 God dear, I did. It seems such a, such a long time ago. Uh, 1991 was my first book for a publisher, which no longer exists, ironically. Thomas Nelson, oh if anybody remembers them. Then I started writing English File, for which I'm probably best known, with Oxford. Mm -hmm. That was published in 1996, 97 which is 24 years ago now, which is a lot. And then I've done mainly work for Richmond since then as a consultant, uh, author of handbook series, primary courses, secondary courses, adult courses. Um, I also worked for the Cultura Inglesa in Brazil. I lived in Brazil for several years. I had a, I co-owned a hotel in Rio. I still have a house in Rio. Um, I have a Brazilian wife, so I'm obviously very fond of Brazil. <laughs> and what's happened? My most important change, which is relevant to today, is uh, since uh, about 19, about 2003, 2004, I've only worked on course books which are specific to a market rather than international course books. And that's primarily because I believe that uh, you, you really should be able to get into the minds of the students linguistically, which is what the topic of today is, obviously. Yeah. I'm much more confident. In fact, I only teach now in Latin America because uh, I speak Spanish and Portuguese, and that's where I'm most comfortable, and French too. Mm -hmm. I've given lectures in Spanish, Portuguese, and French. I've done training in the four, in three languages. And I believe that the key thing really is, is, and this is the crux of our issue today, you have linguistic empathy. If you know the student's mother tongue, you are able to put yourself inside their head. All the research suggests that the most important quality in a teacher is empathy. Mm -hmm. And the key empathy, I believe, as a language teacher is linguistic empathy. When I'm teaching in China or in an Arab country or in, in Turkey or around the world, I never knew really what the students' processes were with regard to the mother tongue. I couldn't anticipate mistakes. I couldn't really work out what they were saying. And a, a lot of what my teaching was based on guessing or over eliciting. You know, I just keep eliciting and eliciting and eliciting until the students said, hallelujah. <laughs> and when they finally say hallelujah, it's normally because they've worked out the equivalent in their own language. And again, that's the secret, really, of, of, of monolingual compared to multilingual teaching, because students, when, when, do, when do teenage and adult students suddenly go hallelujah? It's when they've worked out the equivalent in their mother tongue. And so you, you, you can't stop students. That light from... bulb moment. Yeah, yeah that light bulb moment is, aha, mm -hmm. it is. And they, and they go back to that. They've got the, 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 you know, 
Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The prophet, uh, yeah, they've got they finally it's like a hallelujah moment, I call it. And the hallelujah moment comes when they've worked out the equivalent, I would say, 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. So that's a long introduction. But effectively, I've transformed from a, a multilingual class teacher teaching refugees and so on in the UK ah. to a, a specialist in Latin America, primarily because I love Latin America and also I feel comfortable linguistically. Mm, that's awesome. That's awesome. I think I'm going to go back a little bit and just ask you, actually, that's my very first question. I've got a couple of questions related to the topic, of course, but this is my okay. question now that you talked that you've been everywhere around. Uh, <laughs> how, how, how did you feel about this nomadic life, you know, like being a nomad and just moving one year here, two years there? Uh, was it because you were always trying to find something adventurous and exciting or was there any other reason for that? Well, part, partly adventure, partly curiosity, partly luck, um, <laughs> partly being single, <laughs> which made it a lot of fun. Uh, Maybe that would the, take up for 70% of the, the whole thing. <laughs> look, I don't go any further, my wife's listening, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I mean, the thing is about being a, a teacher, you're always welcome in any country. Mm -hmm. as a t you know, you're going to give as a teacher you know even yeah. though you take at least as much as you give as a teacher yeah. you're always made welcome because you, you've gone as a giver you're not going as a, as a taker you're not going as a, a businessman to make money or whatever you're going as a teacher to give and share and mm -hmm. so because I always felt welcome I kept going and um, lucky me I've been to about 100 countries now which is just a remarkable wow. achievement I'm so lucky and I'm still alive <laughs> after all that <laughs> Oh my goodness! Is there a, is there still a place that you uh, dying to to go, and you haven't been able to? Oh, I could live. I could give you thirty countries at least. I'd love oh, to go to. Give me two. Give me two. Give me two. I'm curious about Japan because it must be so different from what I'm used to. Not to go as a teacher, but as a tourist. Mm -hmm. um, and my daughter's just been. Well, a few years ago, she, my elder daughter's just been to India, and she came back sort of saying, "You have to go, Dad, just to see you know what it's like." So there's two countries for you. I'd like to see most of Africa, most of Asia, and <laughs> the Antarctic. I'd love to see it. Yeah, why not? Why not? If, if, yeah. I'm, if I can live long enough. The only problem is my carbon footprint is a, a bit of a problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, we have to think about that as well. Yeah. You're not going on the back of a horse, right, to this place. So <laughs> 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 might take a while. Uh, awesome. Uh, you... I think it's about time for us to get to the questions, but then my first... It's, the, the questions will start from me and then I'm going to discuss a little bit and then move on to the questions. We may not have time to uh, tackle all of them because we're going to kind of have a conversation. But then I already said people here that, look, we might get covered, you know, like cover everything or not. But then I said that they could just talk to me and then uh, I'll give them a feedback uh, on that. Oh, we could always do a part two. If, if, if people get really interested, I'm happy to do a part two. Of course, awesome. I, I, I like to hear that. I like to hear. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm already <laughs> setting my schedule for that, actually. <laughs> okay. uh, it's the you're paying me. I can't resist the money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's good to make that, these things clear. You know? <laughs> All right, some caveat. Okay, anyway. Um, all right, so my first question is, when was that, a, we you talked about the light bulb moment, like the hallelujah moment. Uh, what was the hallelujah, the light bulb moment that you had to delve into this topic of the importance of L1? Was there anything that happened to you as a teacher that you were like, uh, well, this is it. Like, this is something that people aren't talking about much, but I feel that's really important and we should investigate. Yeah, oh, I can think of a number of occasions. I mean, okay. I, every summer I would come back and work in London. Uh, and um, the, 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 the difference between teaching multilingual classes in, in London and then going abroad again to monolingual classes, I found was fundamental. It was a completely different ball game because, um, and I don't think this is clear enough in the literature, um, certainly on, on my CELTA courses, for example, I would always have a session. I started giving CELTAs in Brazil and I set up CELTAs all around Brazil in Recife, Sao Paulo, Rio, etc. Uh, Salvador as well. Um, and all, on all my CELTA courses since 2001, I always had a block on 
monolingual, multilingual classes, at least one session on the difference, because it's supposed to be an international qualification. And teachers doing the course in Brazil obviously practice primarily on Brazilians, but it's an international qualification and therefore they should at least have some notion of what it's like teaching in multilingual classes, although the monolingual classes are obviously the majority. And I don't think that distinction is made clear enough in the literature. Far too much of what we do is international rather than locally tailored, but that's just a comment. Um, I can remember once in teaching in Egypt, I was teaching for about six months. I was uh, 26 years old. I had a full head of hair. I was relatively good looking. And, and uh, I was using the, the traditional native speaker, I don't speak a word of your language approach, which is effectively bombard and pray. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I, I don't, I had no language hooks to put it on. And mm -hmm. to me, the mother tongue is a hook around which you can work. If you have no notion of the student's language, then you just keep eliciting and eliciting and eliciting until they say hallelujah. Um, but this might take forever and never happen. Exactly. <laughs> and after six months in Egypt, I was getting frustrated because everything seemed to take too long. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why. And so I spoke to a bilingual colleague and because the next lesson was... Um, reported speech and I thought this is utterly ridiculous. I'm asking my students to report their speech to me and I know nothing of their language. I don't even know what it is unreported, let alone reported. And so I asked a colleague, how does it work in Arabic? And, and, and uh, she said to me, well in English it's like this, and in Arabic it's like this and they have that. So the next lesson after I uh, went into class and I just said to guys, okay guys, look at this, don't do this, do that and don't forget this. And they looked at me and they said, Mr. Bol. I said, because they used to call me Bol because they couldn't distinguish P and B. So I was Mr. Bol bouncing around in Egypt for two years. <laughs> they said, Mr. Bol, your Arabic very good. And I said, guys, I'm sorry, you know, I don't speak Arabic. And they asked me, how you know this? How you know, how you know this about our language? And I said, well, I asked a colleague who speaks your language. And she said, they, you know, these are likely to be the mistakes you make. And that was like my hallelujah moment, if you like. I suddenly realized that that was the best place to start. And so since then, what I've been preaching to teachers is that, you know, we have a choice with errors. You're either proactive or reactive. You cannot be proactive with a multilingual class. Huge difference between multilingual and monolingual. But with monolingual classes, you can be utterly proactive. In our case, all our students speak Portuguese at least 80% of their mistakes will come from mother tongue transfer. So if you say at the beginning of the class, don't do that, do this, don't do that, do this, um, then the students are forewarned, it's democratic, it's advantageous, you're not eliciting, it doesn't take long, it takes seconds to, for them to get the message. And what I like about the best is it's totally, it's the same for everybody, it's utterly democratic. Elicitation, you always feed the strong and the weak are kind of left behind. And they, you get this sort of, you know, students at various, various points of, of comprehension around the classroom. When you say, don't do that, do this, they all go, okay, immediately at the same time. So if, if you can get that done at the beginning of your, of your class, then you've got the rest of the class to practice. And the most important thing that can happen in a class is practice. So <clears throat> my, that's uh, my feeling. If, if you want to read about this in uh, New Roots, May 2020, I wrote quite an extensive article. I called it inductive, deductive, or seductive. And my <laughs> seductive method is to begin by just laying out the bare bones of the errors you will make through transfer mm -hmm. and then flagging it up. I, I, I tell teachers to put this on the board, whatever your mistakes you know your students will make with whatever language is in focus, lexis, grammar, phrases, whatever, then flag it, yeah, put it up, correct it on the board. So the students have a reference point. Teaching online, I've I just have on my screen the same thing, what I call the common mistakes. Um, have it on the screen corrected straight away. So the students look at it, read, and I ask them, just have a think. You don't need to speak Portuguese or your mother tongue. Look at it. What, where does this come from? Obviously from Portuguese. Don't do that, do this. And you've got a model for the rest of the class. And in the end, the student, when I correct the students, I just click my fingers and point at the model. Oh, no need for anything awesome. else. And by the, by, they've been, by the time they've been with me two or three classes, they're all clicking their fingers and helping each other in pairs and groups, pointing at the mistake. 
and they have a, a reference for the rest of the class. So the huge difference between monolingual and multilingual is the ability to anticipate. And if we're not anticipating based on our knowledge of the mother tongue, then we're not, we're doing them a disservice and we're slowing down their potential progress. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's really interesting. Like uh, the, the whole aspect of having, uh, I believe that anticipation is definitely uh, the key from a personal perspective, uh, the key to a successful uh, uh, class. Yeah, like if you can't anticipate anything, you're completely in the dark. Yeah, and you pray, like just you said, like you bombard and then you sit back and pray to see if everything is going well. And then some students, they may pretend everything is going well. And also you pretend that everything is going well until the end of the semester of the year, you look back and nobody learned anything. Yeah. <laughs> and quickly, when you turn your back, they okay, because that is it. And then you, you get this sort of you know, quick thing with, with the students, they sort of whisper and we, we close one eye and pretend they haven't done it and move on. But you, know, <laughs> you, you cannot stop students translating. I, I've said this before, the only way to stop students translating, you know, going back to the linguistic base, is to simply cut off their heads, which is actually a crime. <laughs> and you won't have many students left if you decapitate them. So the, the, moment, the moment students are engaged in a second language classroom learning situation or outside too, they are translating all the time. It's a fact of life, it's inevitable. And then this kind of leads to our very first question, uh, actually the second, because I, I asked you the first right now. Uh, it's from Anna Beatriz uh, and she's asking, uh, let me just get the question here. Does the use of L1 interfere negatively in foreign language learning? So it's like a, you, an idea. I kind of answered that in a way already. You can't, one, it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. Two, um, I mean, I don't need a two after that. It's inevitable. So we just have to live with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it can, of course, it, I mean, it interferes in terms of accuracy, but it can also be hugely beneficial. If you speak, Portuguese or Spanish or Romance language, French, Italian, Catalan, Romanian, etc. then you're speaking one of the 10 closest languages to English in terms of Lexis, at least. 58% of English comes from Latin. So when you think about that, you know, where does Portuguese come from? From Latin. So there are thousands of words and lots of suffixes which we should be teaching sooner to our students, which you can build upon and the students can quickly try uh, assim assimilate many, many more words more quickly because of their mother tongue. So, of, of course, it interferes because you can't get rid of it. Of course, they go back to base. But at the same time, we should be celebrating with our students. Thank God you speak Portuguese. Imagine if you came from a, a more exotic language background, you wouldn't have this advantage. And something I, I, I've just been touring Mexico, lucky me. And I just think the key point I'd be making is that an A1 Latino or an A2 Latino or B1 Latino has nothing to do with an A1, A2 or B1 Chinese or Arabic speaker. They have huge advantages. There's no, they're not level in any shape or form. They, you know, they can they have access to a lot more words. They can read well above the level. They, they've got a lot more in their subconscious they can bring to the front if we help them with pronunciation and so on. So the, the, and, and I have a, one of my criticisms of the, of the Marco is it doesn't accommodate this remotely sufficiently. Our students are way ahead in terms of passive knowledge. And you know, Portuguese grammar is more similar than different from English for a start. So you've got all this huge base upon which to build. So dragging them through an international textbook which ignores these advantages is by no means the best way to teach adults. Taking, taking the cue from Beatrice's uh, question, and I believe that that's the point that people have in mind, like uh, the, actually the, the business people in the market, in the ELT market, that is like, uh, at least in Brazil, uh, that uh, if you are translating, yeah, or if you are using the, uh, the mother tongue, your L1 as a cane to support your, your, uh, your learning, you are doing it wrong, you, are, you shouldn't be doing that at all because it will uh, damage your learning or some sort of that. Um, but uh, um, the point is, how do we know that it, it does and it doesn't? Like, uh, um, do you have already collected too much evidence to say that, yes, 
supporting of the L1 definitely helps more than actually harms. Can you say that or Look, is I mean, still? I'm sure one of my fundamental criticisms, certainly in Mexico, perhaps less so because Portuguese is nearer to English, so it's easier to make more progress in Brazil, uh -huh. is that the, the, the students are being passed up from A1 to A2, even up to B1, with inadequate, inadequate English. I've been focusing, and I have a course book, which I'm sure I'll mention at some point, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is uh, based upon the notion of early fluency. And this fits in with the paradigm shifts which have come in the last century. And monolingual teaching, no mother tongue, you know, I have a gun. Yeah, if you speak Portuguese, I'll kill you. That kind of notion is, um, was the bedrock of, of 20th century teaching. That was pre-internet. That was pre-English becoming totally global. Now, it, you know, we're now teaching it's plurilingualism, bilingualism. And you, you know, by definition, bilingual, you're learning the two together. They support each other. You can't separate them out. So um, a lot of things have, have changed. Uh, we used to try to produce native-like English. Now it's very much, you know, um, uh, translanguaging, translanguaging, bringing in you know, everything that you can possibly bring in, your body language, your mother tongue, music, anything you know linguistically, which will help you get your message across. So it's a very different world now. And one thing, I, again, one thing I've been talking about quite a lot recently is globally, there are about 2 billion people speak English now. You know, three quarters of the, of the users of English are non-native. And you've got one and a half billion Romance language speakers all of whom almost certainly are uh, going to be talking, uh, are going to recognize um, the, 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 if you like, the less native-like forms. If I give you a choice, if the students ask you, como se fala tolera in English, they say, yeah, how, do, how do I say uh, tolera in English? What would you give them? Would you give them put up with, or would you give them uh, uh, tolerate? And most international course books would teach put up with because they have this notion of native speaker frequency, but the far more common form is tolerate. If you think about this 1.5 billion non-native, uh, sorry, Romance language users, all of whom understand tolerate, plus the fact that we know put up with students can't use complex phrasal verbs like that until at least B2, probably C1. So the, the whole thing is has turned around. So that in itself, if you listen to a German talking to a Japanese, talking to a Brazilian in a restaurant, they won't be using complex phrasal verbs. They'll be using the more recognizable Latinate forms, which is a huge advantage for us. So my proof is just traveling around the world and listening to people in restaurants, airports, et cetera. You know, people accommodate each other. People don't stretch. And what I find ironic in Brazil, if I observe a class, you have a native in the room, and the students say, how do you say banera in English? You can bet your life the teacher would say, put up with, because they'd want to show off that they, they know that form, no matter what the level is. Whereas, of course, you're much better off teaching tolerate. That sometimes because, sometimes more like, that's how I say it, you know, since I'm the native speaker, <laughs> that's how I say then when, it. You know, when they get to B2, maybe bring in both forms, but at the beginning, there's no point whatsoever in, yeah. in introducing forms which are too complex when there is a simpler form. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what I've been working on for, for, for the last 10, 15 years, and I'm utterly convinced just through my own experience. And also what's really interesting is I produced this book, English ID, now in its second edition, fully digitalized, wonderful. Here it is, da, 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 dee, 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 dee. okay, awesome. <laughs> which is entirely... You can, just, entirely show, you can like, just show it and flip some pages can, as well. Can I show, show, no, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a marvelous course book. The, the only course book written for Latin America. Six levels, awesome. marvelous, guaranteed to teach 30% more vocabulary at each level than other courses. Ching! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, right, I had to, had to do that. Yeah. Accommodate, accommodate this because I'm not being paid. I feel entitled to do that. <laughs> I am just, just, just show whatever you want to show. If you want to get a tour no, around the house, that no, would be awesome as well. I think you only have to Google my name or look on Wikipedia. It's all, it's all there. Yeah. Um, what, what, I've, now I've completely forgotten myself because of the commercial break. <laughs> no, yeah, you were saying about the uh, uh, using tolerate, put up with, and the native yeah, speaker in the classroom. Yeah. If you, I mean, if you, if, if you bring in those forms naturally and, and early, I would argue that students at most levels, you know, levels mm -hmm. in course books learn about a thousand words. In my book, I claim to teach 1,300 at each level. Why? Because in the text you have much richer language because I'm not hiding words like tolerate 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, explode, whatever the words are. I'm not hiding them because uh, I know my audience. And what's interesting, going back to basics, when you plan a class, okay, you pick up an authentic text, a song, an article, you know, something from digital media. How do you judge the level of it? You look at the text and you think, well, okay, we haven't done the third conditional yet or whatever. So you might think, oh, that's a bit tricky. So you, you look at it in terms of complexity, in terms of what they've already learned. But uh, you, when you're planning a class, you're working from your knowledge of the mother tongue. As a teacher, how do you know what's difficult for your students through your knowledge? And this isn't sp spoken about nearly enough on teacher training courses. You know, when you're planning your class, the first thing you do is go back to base. What, what's this in Portuguese? What's this in Portuguese? Then you go to class and say, forget Portuguese. And that's an utter crime because what you've done yourself is entirely what you're not allowing the students to do. So yeah. we, we pretend the students don't do what we do to begin with. <laughs> so I mean, okay. it's, it, there are so many contradictions of what we do. You plan through your knowledge of the students and their mother tongue, which is why planning is very different in multilingual classes in the States, in Britain, etc. And that, to me, that's the essence of, 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 of the issue. We induct, you know, the, the, sort of the holy grail is induction. You know, don't tell them, ask. And whenever you ask, it's always the same students who answer anyway. The strong dominate and the weak have to catch up. So that's very divisive and slow. You know, the standard classes where you say, read the text once and answer the questions. And the, and the students say, OK, teacher, we've done that. Can we go now? It wasn't very interesting. It was a text about Poland or Turkey and I'm in Brazil. So frankly, can we move on? And then you say, no, 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 no. Let's go back and study the vocabulary. Read it again and study the vocabulary. And the students go, oh, <laughs> the same text again. OK, so they go with you because you're the teacher and you're the boss. And you go back. Yeah. They go back through the text. They read it again. You study the vocabulary. And then the students say, can we go now, teacher? Can we go now? <laughs> Anything but the text. They say, ah, no. Now we have to read it again. A third time, a third time, yes, a third time. Why? Why? To extract the grammar, which is oh. exactly the same in Portuguese. What a waste of time. What a horrible route. And so you have to teach like that when you're teaching Korean students or Arabic uh -huh. students, mixed up levels. You know? mm -hmm. um, but when you're teaching in Brazil, you don't need to do that. You that's, say, that's, you know, that's so true. You know, Penny Ur says, my, one of my gurus, Penny Ur, Penny Ur I'm never quite sure about uh, thank you. Uh, let's go for our. I love her to death, but I never know how to pronounce her name. <laughs> Sorry, Penny. Um, she says, you know, in the introduction to her advanced vocabulary teaching book, she says you should use translation to teach vocabulary. She, yeah, you know, at advanced levels because it saves time. If you know the mother tongue, you can you can elicit it. You can tell them. There's no point in you know dragging it out in the name uh -huh. of induction. You know, what's the point? You know, what you want them to do is use it. <laughs> you understand and use it, you know, just dragging through this eternal elicitation progress. And also it's divisive because you know, some students will get it and other students won't. And then what do you do as a teacher? Especially if you're teaching in a university with 30 or 40 students. Yeah, that's the thing. This, this aspect of actually uh, uh, teaching um, advanced vocabulary uh, through translation is related to my next question, in fact. Uh, and this question was brought by Marcelo Luis. He is uh, from Sao Paulo, but he's based in uh, the north of the country. And then he's asking, what's the best use of L1 for both basic and advanced levels? Is there a place for L1 in advanced lessons? Well, I think I just answered that. I mean, if you've got um, you know, complex, uh, slight similarities, I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, something like, uh, it's worth it. You know, that, that phrase, I mean, how long does it take to, you know, it's not worth it. What does that mean? You know, it's going to take you five minutes through elicitation. If you just give oh, yeah. this in English, this in Portuguese, okay, let's go. It's, you just get four minutes to use it instead of that dragging students torturously through it. So, and it's the same at most levels. There are lots of ways of doing it. You just send students to their phones, their digital dictionaries, get them to whisper to each other. I never let my students shout out in Portuguese. You know, when I come to class, I go, guys, I will let you speak Portuguese sometimes together. I may use it myself, for example, to accelerate process. You have to trust me on that. But 98% of my class will be in English from me to you. But, you know, I will use Portuguese intelligently as I want you to. But I don't want you shouting out because at some point we need a, a control thing. And I, I have a sort of metaphorical chapelle. 
and my hat. I mean, it's time to be, speak Portuguese. I put on my chapeau. Okay, and then I speak blah, 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 in Portuguese. For example, the instructions for a complex activity when you've only got five minutes left at the end of the lesson. You know, okay, guys, save time. I'm going to do. I'm going to quickly give you instruction in Portuguese so you get five minutes to practice. Otherwise, it's going to take five minutes to understand, and you won't get the practice. So that's mm -hmm. the payoff. That's, and I think one of the things we need to train teachers to do is to manage Portuguese. There's no point in prohibiting it anymore. We've moved on. What we need to do now is that training colleges try and work out when it is or it isn't best to use mother tongue. And I'm thinking about efficiency. Class time is precious. You know, students are paying for that time. Is it really worth torturing them when you could, there are other quick ways of, of getting things through? I let my students whisper in Portuguese. What does it mean in Portuguese? Okay, everybody happy. And you can see in a, a presential class, and that's the beauty of being back in the classroom. I was actually in a classroom again after two years last week. It was magic awesome. because you can you can feel what's going on. You, you know, all that sort of you know you can see from the eyes, the smiles, the tears. You know you know what's going on, and so you can you, you, you know you've got your hand on the rudder of the class. And, 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 and in a sense, that's you need that feel. You need that feel as a teacher. And a lot of it, as a new teacher, comes through trial and error. You have to, you've got to experiment to find different alternatives. There's no one way to do anything. And what's your take on the on certain uh, schools uh, and maybe teachers out there that, like, um, they still insist in not using L1 as a tool, not not as like teaching English through Portuguese. That I think that we are not saying that. Uh, we we're saying that using, uh, uh, as you said, intelligently the language you know, as a tool yeah, to learn. But some schools, they will reject those uh, these ideas completely, and you're just fine with that, right? Well, it's a marketing option, isn't it? I mean, they, some, if they choose to market themselves in that way, then they're kind of clinging to the 20th century notion, the hangover from the last century, mm -hmm. and that's the best way to do things. There is zero, zero research to suggest that banning translation is the most effective way to teach, certainly teens and adults, and I would argue children too, because people get lost, you know, and they have a resource, a, a starting point, which they will go back to anyway. So it, we can, it's very, it's a very blunt instrument, just say no, 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 no. It's not very subtle. And I think, you know, we've had pedagogy for centuries now, and you know, I think our pedagogy should be a little more subtle than zero no no when it's actually a contradiction anyway it's so i mean by by all means market it if you think it's going to make you money that's fine but then it's not the most efficient way to do things you know and i think that we students will translate come what may so we need to find ways to work overtly rather than covertly with the language because they'll, they'll still be working they'll still be working you know secretly with it anyway every time you look away they'll help each other or teaching online they'll have their phone just out of sight, translating everything as they go. And so, you know, it, to me, it's, it's pure marketing. That's your, you know, by all means, if it works for you, that's, that's your choice. But it's very difficult to argue that is the best way to actually teach a language. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Marina Cruz, let me see. Yes, Marina Cruz, she's asking, Paul, could you give me, let's put us, yeah. but okay, well, she said, could, could you give me personally <laughs> Uh, uh, some tips on how to use the L1 to teach complex grammar. That's quite well, the I think, I mean, what, Well, let's, let's think of something complex. What, what should we do? I mean, something like the, the conditionals, which are relatively simple for our students, uh, mm -hmm. is considered complex elsewhere. The third, you know, it's the longest verb form sentence we have. You know, if I hadn't, I wouldn't have, and all that. Um, my, you know, the quickest way by far is to put it up signaling where the translation doesn't work at the beginning of the class. You know, the best thing you can do is anticipate it. I mean, something like the present perfect, for example, which takes a long time to establish. But you, what you need at the beginning, I think, is multiple examples of where they go wrong with since and for, when they use the present instead of the, the present perfect. You need a series of examples corrected so that the students see the range of options which are covered in both languages and the big differences between them. So I, that's where I, you know, you can't teach it all at once, but for students, if they keep translating sentence by sentence, they never get the big picture. So in a sense, you might say, look guys, all of these sentences, the different 
you know, elements of the present perfect, these are where we're going to go wrong because this is how it works in English. So, you know, beware, this is going to be tricky. Whereas with something like the conditionals, you just say, guys, happy Christmas today is going to be so easy because it's so similar in Portuguese. I often start like that, guys, it's your lucky day. It's very <laughs> similar in Portuguese. We're going, to, we're going to say some really good stuff today. Or the opposite, the present perfect, for example. Guys, look, all these subtle differences between the two, I don't expect you to learn it once, but beware, this is tricky. So we're going to take step by step going through since and for and eventually reach the present perfect continuous, blah, blah, blah. But you know, I think they need to see the picture at the beginning just to see. Otherwise, they're, they're working through translation all the time. So you know, something complicated like the present perfect, I would give multiple examples at the beginning because then they can start to help each other. When you because you can never control you know which aspect you're actually practicing because they all get muddled up in a text. So at least if the students have got you know, hooks. To me, it's that hook thing. Once you've put the hooks in place and the students are allowed to buzz and group work and pair work and help each other, you've got more help, more chance of the, the students, you know, helping each other onto the hooks. Oh. So I want more correct forms around more quickly, you know, upon which to hang themselves, you know, not hang themselves, <laughs> hang them, to hook, them, hook themselves, sorry. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, I, it, it, it's, it's also the, the other argument, which is very strong, that Hugh Della talks about this a lot, is that no, uh, translation is the strongest form of noticing. There's no better way to notice. But you don't need to translate verbally. What I do a lot is just say, okay, guys, look, look at that sentence, phrase, whatever. <clears throat> think, think, think. Run it through in both languages in your head. Notice. Okay? Nobody, don't speak Portuguese, you don't need to speak. I'll ask you to think, you know. It's a class, you're supposed to think. So try to have a little think, yeah. Take 10, 10 seconds. Then maybe whisper to the person next to you what you notice if they're low level. And if it's here, yeah, they, you know, they can quickly whisper it. So, and you can pick up on that as a teacher. And then you, you know what to do next from the response in the eyes, the face, the buzz in the room, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So my feeling is that's a good way to use it. But I mean, translation, you know, I use Google Translate all the time. You know, the other day I had to do an hour presentation, 15 minutes beforehand, they said to me, um, can you give the presentation in Spanish rather than in Portuguese because the coordinators and directors of the school don't speak Spanish. Yeah. So as quickly as I could, I ran as many of my slides through uh, Google Translate. There were errors, but I mean, comprehensible. Mm -hmm. And I managed to put together in 15 minutes a comprehensible PowerPoint mm -hmm. so that the people in the room could at least read the content of my talk, which allowed me to mix English and Spanish because the teachers wanted to hear some English. So at least by having it on the screen, I have the text in, 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 in Spanish through Google Translate because that's all I had time for. And the students, sorry, the teachers were getting, I was mixing Spanish and, and English you know, just for fun. And also, what I like to do is, you know, I would put every time it's a cognate, I'll use the cognate in English. So I should to take it continue instead of continua. And, 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 you know, that, that time, just every time I'm conscious it's a, a cognate, I try and mix the languages so they keep hearing English. And at the end, and in my slides when I'm teaching, I, I, I everything which is a cognate, I'll put in English. So you know, I run it through Google Translate and then quickly change the, the cognates back to English. So they get a mixed text, which is really interesting. And I think, wow, a lot of this is in English, but I understand everything. There's nothing more motivating if you're teaching teams, for example. It's a great little technique. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, I think that's really we can all copy exactly what you, you did and just start using it more in our classes. That's awesome. Uh, I believe that what you're saying has a lot, has a lot to do with easing the pressure. Yeah, that's the first thing, easing the uh -huh. pressure in the classroom and so that people get comfortable being there for that class, for that semester, for that year, whatever. Yeah, I, I believe that was the first thing. And the second thing you said that I don't hear many people talking about it is having this time for students to actually think. Yeah, uh, it seems that nowadays I don't know you if you if you uh, if you agree with me on that, but um, it seems to me that everything needs to be in a rush. Yeah, everything needs to yeah. <laughs> everything needs to be uh, covered, and at the same time that needs to be covered well. Students need to be having lots of fun, 
yeah <laughs> that kind of fun that they are kind of <laughs> running around yeah juggling yeah whatever <laughs> jumping through hoops whatever you're doing <laughs> uh, like a circus a real circus and um kind of uh, and and because of that um the result that they want seems to me most of the times and then when i say they i'm putting like this they in a very general way um they want is actually students to have fun exactly okay. yeah that's yeah, that's are, it if they are, are fun we're, we're we're entertainers it's always been part of teaching isn't it particularly yeah. commercial teaching where yeah. the people are paying they're not going to pay I mean, you're not like a, a trainer torturing somebody, a, you know, a personal trainer, although sometimes it feels like it. But uh, no, they, they, everything is, you know, hungry, McDonald's, it's, it's, it's instant gratification. It's, it's, our society is full of, wherever you look, it's instant gratification. And students want instant gratification. The other day I saw Black Friday, Babel, learn a language in five days, you know, and, and, and people still fall for this nonsense. It's, it's, uh, <clears throat> It's, a lot of it's to do with marketing, a lot of it's to do with the reality that people need to learn English ASAP to get to, um, you know, to get a new job in a call centre or whatever it is. They've got to get a level to work in a call centre. So you know, it's understandable because everything else is the same. It's not just language teaching. But let's be honest, you know, what you can achieve, I, can, I think you can achieve the early fluency more quickly through cognates, basing your... Than anything else and I, I've done quite a lot of studies of um, polyglots so in fact I've been through every polyglot site I could find on the internet and the key I've got a list um, which I haven't brought with me but we could talk about it another time the key things which polyglots say is you need to base your initial use of the language on fluency just go for fluency you know jump in throw yourself in it's all about fluency it's not about accuracy. You need you need to express yourself as fast as you possibly can, uh, and you need to be satisfied with that expression, or you'll give up. So that that, that you know, motivation comes primarily from success. So and the other thing they say is base you know these people who speak six, seven, eight, nine languages. I speak four. How did I do it? But, you know, I learned French upon French. I I learned Spanish based upon my knowledge of French and Portuguese based on my knowledge of the other two. So, I mean, and, and, and I, I concur with the, the polyglots who say it's all about cognates, you know, looking for cognates, looking for similarities, building on common ground. And that allows you to sort of branch out more quickly. And it gives you the confidence to think, I, mean, I couldn't do this in Chinese or Arabic, of course, but I, we can and we should. Uh, I really think it should be absolutely stated in most of our work that, you know, I as the teacher am reaching my conclusions on, based upon my knowledge of your mother tongue, you're doing the same, hey, let's dance, rather than pretend there's anything else going on. You know, the hard thing is, is once you open the, it's a slippery slope, if once you open the door to, 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 to Portuguese in our case, then it's really hard to stop, which is why I, I train teachers, you know, put on your hat, now it's Portuguese, I'm no longer your clown, I'm no longer your model, I'm actually the accelerator here. I'm trying to cut through this crappy part of the class to get to the juicy stuff when you will be entertained again and everybody will be laughing again because we've cut through it more quickly using a resource which we have. So but my have feeling is that the, 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 you know, in terms of entertainment, in terms of the you know that side of things, I think it's an advantage because you can cut through and it's not entertaining to allow you to have a much more, you know, a fun class as a result of your earlier comprehension and therefore better opportunities to practice. Have, have you faced any sort of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, maybe teachers that you've trained uh, and having having this perspective of using the LLM as a, as a tool, uh, have you had any like bad comments on that from the trainees? Yeah, I've been, uh, I've had people walk out of the room. I've had people oh. check me. What's, what's been interesting, I've been selling this, this book, which, you know, funnily enough, it's a wonderful book, English ID, in case you've just turned on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's, there's teachers who've, been, who've uh, been using it for two years, and they came up to me just last week in Mexico and said, Paul, I've just realised all the common mistakes are based upon your knowledge of Spanish and Portuguese. I said, you've been using the book for two years and you've just realised it. <laughs> Teachers have a block, they have a mental block, which is that, you know, 
somehow we've got this hangover from the previous century. Maybe it's the marketing, maybe it's the instructions from the schools, maybe it's the, you know, the expectation of the students too. I don't, it's a mix of, of factors. But it's very, teachers find it very hard to see the wood from the trees. But so what I do now is I go back to how do you plan your class? You know, it's through your knowledge of Portuguese. How did I plan this book? Through my knowledge of Portuguese and Spanish. That's why you see all these words which are not normally taught right from the very beginning. And they go, ah, it, and then they have their hallelujah moments. <laughs> and they suddenly realize, I know, I know what you're doing, but doesn't that mean speaking a lot of, of Spanish or Portuguese? And I said, well, have you been speaking lots of Spanish? No, I haven't. I've been speaking less because they understand more. Well, you see, the method works. So people, and now I realize that to, to sell my book better, I have to start in a different place because it's quite a big leap for teachers to actually get on board with this because it, it runs counter to a lot of what they've been told, like don't or you yeah. shouldn't. Yeah, of course, you should use the mother tongue. Of course, we do use the mother tongue. It's just how, how, how often, how much, where and when. Those are the key elements. And as I say, I'm not suggesting that teachers need to speak virtually any mother tongue themselves in order to actually use it intelligently and that to me that's the key you don't need to speak it to use it that's the myth propagated by the publishers who want to sell the same book in turkey poland china wherever else they can sell it it's not a tailored method and using a non-tailored method produces it's a lot of work for teachers i mean how long have you spent adapting and you know, oh, and so on, and, you know <laughs> simplifying you taking the text out of the book rekeying it or adding in extra words to make it more interesting for your students etc 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 one thing i hate is when you see books which have a glossary oh, for yeah. cognates and i just think you don't know my students at all because all these words you're glossing they know these words they're the same in the mother tongue they just need help with pronunciation they don't need a glossary they need more pronunciation and i think again that's a weakness in most course books they don't give adequate pronunciation too much focus on meaning not enough help on with pronunciation my course has more listening and pronunciation than any other course for that reason because that's what our students need that's true. So again, yeah. once you know your audience let's be honest if as a teacher you, you're most comfortable when you know the group and it's the same thing as materials producers. It's much easier to produce good material if you know your audience. When you're writing for the world, you're guessing. Mm, that's guessing, wow, okay. guessing based upon experience. It could be a really wonderful guess. I've written international course books, mm -hmm. you know, very famous ones. And, but you know, sit, that's fine. I've done that. Now I've moved into where I'm most comfortable, which is where I can bounce things back and forth with the students. I'm a much better teacher because I'm, I share that linguistic empathy. Uh, could you share with us some of the features of this new edition? Uh, because I, I worked with the ID, uh, with the English ID, uh, uh, for two years. And two things that I really loved it, and I don't know if you're still keeping the second edition, uh, is the uh, highlighting of the of the stress in the in the text, like with a reddish color. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, that one. And definitely, like, the common mistakes uh, yeah. box. Yeah, are you keeping those? Oh, thank you very much for asking me about my book. <laughs> Absolutely, we've, we've increased it now. There's a, a common mistake from Portuguese or Spanish because the book is for Latin America mm -hmm. in every single class. So now I've increased it to, uh, there's 110 common mistakes in the, the first book alone, for example. The word stress thing, which I, I started doing an English file first, yeah. and then we carried on in English ID, is uh, basically it's a wonderful expression of syllabus. If, if the stress is pink, it's a new word. So when you look at the class, you can see what's new and the mm -hmm. students can see it too. So it's much better value because it gives you more guidance. And if it's not pink and it's polysyllabic, then clearly it's, a, it's supposed to be a known word and you mm -hmm. somebody in the class should be able to produce it or at least know what it means. Uh -huh. <coughs> if it has the pink stress on it, clearly it's new. And uh, whenever you see a, a, whenever you see a cognate, I, the first thing I say is, you know, what I love to do is with, with English ideas, for example, you've got a text like that quite long, maybe 300 word text for beginners, which most course books don't have. And I say, as soon as the students come to class, just look at the text, underline all the words which look like Portu uh, Portuguese words. In pairs, try to pronounce them with the pink stress, obviously helping you. Then uh, do our mesmo de sempre, this, you know, whatever you're going to do, teach the class, read the text, study the grammar, talk about qualquer coisa, 
And then at the end of the class, so just before you leave, go back to the words which you underlined or circle, and in pairs, say them better and celebrate the fact that you speak Portuguese. And I do this with songs, any authentic text. It's a great starting point. Quickly run through the text. It's a great first skim. Find, find the cognates, try to pronounce them. Any false cognates, maybe you can pick, up, pick them up, but I don't worry too much about false cognates because there are so few. And then um, at the end of the class, just before you leave, go out of the class saying, wow, thank God I speak Portuguese. I just picked up all these words. So that's you can nice never thing. be too happy to speak Portuguese, to be able to speak Portuguese, right? <laughs> After uh, the if, teachers, if teachers haven't seen ID, look at the audio script. The audio script has two or three pronunciation activities every lesson. I mean, you know, an audio script should be a ph phonological. We should be helping with the phonology of listening. Yeah. And you can't do that with a black and white reading text. You need color, you need tasks, so the students can listen again and notice both spelling and pronunciation. To my mind, English spelling is just as difficult as English grammar, but where do teachers focus? Mm -hmm. I always go to the grammar and the students are kind of left to swim with the spelling. So I, I've got spelling activities for pretty much one in every class, noticing a pattern which produces a sound. Um, if you want to know more about the features of the book, a, a song line in every class. So we've got a, a pronunciation. Maybe at the end I could show you a, a translation activity with a song. That I think I've got a, a transparency here. So let me know. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and find okay. it on the PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, see, I have one, one last question here from uh, Caroline uh, Costa. And she works for a bilingual school. You know, the, the bilingual schools are just taking over the country. Uh, yeah. <laughs> every single corner there is a new bilingual school uh, opening up since that's a very good business uh, <laughs> but okay she's asking how L1 can be used to help children in a bilingual school can I show you two slides quickly which of might course. give you the answer sure. um, can you see can I, I need to just share my screen yeah I think that you're allowed to do it uh, if you click on share screen and screen just like just near the glass here we go yeah let me try okay let's tr try this just go back to here okay and then uh, we're nearly there don't go away awesome. yes this is uh something for a, can you see that yep so imagine you're teaching a, a class about the environment mm -hmm. what i do um is just uh, sorry I, I haven't put any animation in but Imagine you're teaching a class so just about the environment. It could be geography, it could be science, it could be anything. Just look at the text that you're using or whatever you're using and pull out all the cognates and put them on the board, ideally with the stress marks as we've just been talking about. And get the students just to try and pronounce them at the beginning of the class, see the words, and it contextualizes the words and you can enrich the class so much by looking at that. This is quite high level, obviously, but you know, thinking about bilingual education where teachers are teaching, you know, CLIL. They have any content-based lesson. If you look at the text and pull out the cognates first, it gives the context, it gives confidence. And you can then use the words yourself. What I do is I slow them down, you know, carbon dioxide. And I do the same with instructions. If you say continue, if you say go on or carry on, they say go where? You know, where is on teacher? If you say continue and then say it again, continue. So I slow down cognates, mm -hmm. say them once so they can understand, and then say them again more naturally. So carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide. So whenever you're, you're working on the basis of cognates, say them slowly so everybody can understand. You know, distort them, biodiversity, and everybody gets the message. And then say it a little bit more quickly, and then maybe a third time as fast as you can, just so students get comfortable with comprehension and then pronunciation. And you can throw these words in whenever you want to. So whenever you see a, a word which is guessable, then you know, just say it slowly so the students can hear it syllable by syllable and then speed it up. And then you can bring in such, such rich language at every level. I don't know if that answers your question. With oh, kids, I mean, another thing you can do with kids just very quickly, I should show you the, the song that I prepared because I know we're running out of time. In the very first lesson, in my book, which is called English ID, is, is remarkably good. Um, <laughs> I can attest to that, it is. There's a, there's a song in every lesson, okay? There's a, uh, 
And the very first song in the book is this, when I see your face, there's not a thing that I would change, which everybody knows is, you know, I hope you recognize, not the, <laughs> it's Bruno Mars, okay? What I do is this, I ask students to translate it, not in the classroom, but for homework, okay? So, and then that's what they get. No, sorry, I, 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 didn't, I did this very quickly for you just now. It, it, it's not Spanish, it's Portuguese. In English, there, I ask them to count the words. So get kids to put it through Google Translate. Then count the words in English, count the words in Portuguese. So in Spanish, in English is 23, in Portuguese, it's 19. In Spanish, it's 15. So it's fewer words in Spanish because they don't use pronouns, for example. Yeah, in Portuguese, you use more pronoun, pronoun, pronouns. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this, notice the differences and highlight the difference. These, those are the differences there. Those words are what you would consider to be the differences. And then find the connection. Every lesson in English ID, you have, um, there's a puzzle that you have to connect. The, why did I choose that song line? Because it links to the topic, the grammar, the theme, whatever it is. And the students, so there's always a puzzle based around authentic English in every class. But what you can do with Google Translate is fantastic. Notice this lesson I'm teaching, you're and you are, because it's the first lesson. Okay, so I get them to notice the two forms, sing it, you're amazing, just the way you are with a word. And of course, because, I mean, karaoke is the best pronunciation activity in the world. Yeah. So they go, you are, and they get that intrusive W straight away. You are. They, so you've got that lovely model there. And then yeah. I use it as a mnemonic. So when you say to students, uh, is this a pair of glasses? And they say, yes, it's. Then you say, no, 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 go back to Bruno Mars. You are, ah, yes, it is. So it's, I use, so to me, Bruno Mars is a, a mnemonic for a non-contracted form. Mm -hmm. It's quite a strange, it's a strange, <laughs> not, nobody else in the world thinks of Bruno Mars as a non-contracted form at the end of the sentence. But to me, Bruno Mars is a non-contracted form at the end of the sentence. That's so once awesome. you start getting, getting kids to just put the little extracts of music through Google Translate, just word counting, simple word counting, yeah. highlighting differences. You've got all that wonderful information. And of course, you've got wonderful pronunciation models too. And if the students in my course book, for example, they look at the, um, the song that I've chosen, they say, oh God, I hate Bruno Mars, you know, who chose this? Then I say, okay, for homework, and this is a little bit higher than children, you'd need to go in, you know, to teens, but for homework, find one line, only one line from a song which you do like, which contains you are or your or are you or even aren't if you wish and the next lesson you get five ten fifteen lines and i have two rules the students you must you're responsible for the pronunciation you need to karaoke that line <clears throat> and you need to know the meaning so put it through google translate first so when what you know students say what does it mean you can tell them so I, I, basically it's a wonderfully organic way to enrich every class when people say to me your book is a little bit shorter than other books, you know, most books are 10, are 12 units, mine's 10. And the reason for that is because um, I think that we should be doing things like this. We should be using translation outside the classroom, using all the digital tools available now and more, uh, and, and getting students to explore and discover through very short text translations. I don't mean long translations in class are really boring, but just uh -huh. mini, mini text translations, you know, just little bits of authentic English, which they can sing, for example, is wonderfully enriching. And uh, that's the sort of way I've been going now that I'm so keen on, 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 on you know, and aware of, of quite how important the mother tongue is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're doing this like as homework and some people that might feel, or some schools that might feel that the teacher shouldn't be allowed to speak uh, Portuguese, <laughs> for example. Yeah. Okay, no, but well, they're not speaking true, Portuguese. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's homework, well, that you know, they're they are working at home, yeah, it's not inside the classroom, yeah, so, and they will well, do it, it anyways. <laughs> it makes no it sense whatsoever, if you think about it, it makes no sense whatsoever. The idea of prohibiting Portuguese outside the classroom is a total nonsense, because, I mean, you know, I've got grandmother screaming, and the kids running around, and, and the television, and my friends t texting me in Portuguese, and then we say, think in English. <laughs> You know, how on earth am I going to think in English when I'm surrounded by Portuguese and my first thoughts come to me in English? And do we even think in a language anyway? That's a topic for another day. 
<laughs> that's a topic for another day that we're definitely scheduling <laughs> uh, for our next day indeed and wow okay here's the whole series yeah Absolutely. i confess that I, I worked from the uh the green one up to the blue one yeah mm -hmm. uh i didn't have the uh actually these uh identities the ones that b 2 c one are they new was there like an older version of no, those the, the wonderful luis octavio bajos and I wrote those things, uh, I think it was kind of, I've lost track of time now, I think it was three or four years ago now, uh -huh. and they're the B2 and the C1 levels, and um, the approach is, obviously, when you, as you get higher, the students, the whole idea of introducing Cognates early is to give students more fluency, more confidence, mm -hmm. so complex grammar and, you know, the heavy duty stuff, complex phrasal verbs, etc., tends, I think, the best place for that is B2, once they're already talking. Yeah. Of course, you can drip in what they need. Of course, one of the key things I think in language teaching is we don't make sufficient distinction between what students need to understand, which is often native speaker like movies, music, etc., video game, whatever whatever it is that they, they, their input is, is often going to include a lot of native speakerisms. Uh -huh. And then what students can produce and what our Portuguese speaking students can produce is much higher level at A1, A2, B1, et cetera, than exotic language background students whose mother tongue doesn't include all these common, this commonality, if you like. So that's so I, the B2 and C1 levels, uh, are that's where I'm doing the polishing. That's where, that's where the hair splitting should come to. You know, I don't care about in, at, on with beginners, as long as they say something. And even if they don't say in, at, on, I normally understand. But all this, you know, the, the detailed stuff needs to come in, I think, once students have the confidence to accommodate it. Otherwise, they're trying to accommodate the complex before they can walk. Mm -hmm. so, so, like, so you're brushing up on accuracy uh, from... Uh, well, no, I, 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 accuracy, I've got common mistakes all the way through. You always mm -hmm. need, you know, you can anticipate accuracy, but you need to allow fluency. Okay. I mean, if you haven't had a session on correction, I'd love to give you a session on correction. On the, but I think the hardest thing in teaching is actually perhaps apart from knowing when to actually use the mother tongue, which is controversial, is actually correction. When, when, when should I intervene and how should I intervene and, and yeah. so on, you know, uh, you know, individually, collectively, today, tomorrow, never, you know, it's a big, big topic. But if, if, you're, you know, if you're trying to produce uh, a plurilingual English language, English as a lingua franca speaking adult, then a lot of things change. And, and, and I think, again, when you put that, you know, the notion of translanguaging, plurilingualism, English as a lingua franca, if you couple that with all the advantages which come from speaking Portuguese and you try and blend that together, I'm absolutely sure we can advance uh, English language teaching much more quickly in Brazil if we drop some of the ban, you know, ban the bomb, ban translation, and also correct, 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 you must be correct. You cannot live, I cannot show you the past tense until you've all got the third person S. You know, that, that's not how life is. And, and I think what I love about the world is as English becomes ever more a tool, lingua, <clears throat> as a lingua franca to the world, it doesn't belong to anybody. Then, um, you know, I think the area of correction becomes very interesting indeed. You know, and perhaps the hardest thing for Brazilians it, on the back of that is, um, you kind of have to listen to students as if you didn't speak Portuguese yourself. Because knowing when to intervene, uh, you, you, you know what they're trying to say because you speak Portuguese. And you've probably said things like this yourself during your own progress. But um, you need to try and listen to them and accept that, that what they're saying is, you know, if I were Chinese, Arabic, etc., would I comprehend this? And if you would, if you think you would comprehend this as a speaker of a non-romance language, speak, then you probably need to let it go. And, uh, and your intervention really depends on um, what is comprehensible or not to somebody who you are not, <laughs> which is very difficult indeed. So perhaps that's a topic for, that's a topic for another day. Well, I think that we already have to schedule three different days, you know, so that we can cover all the topics. <laughs> well, it's, great, it's great fun talking to you anyway. So I, awesome. I, I don't get out of the house as much as I used to. So it's really nice to be able to let me free and speak. <laughs> <laughs>
that's great. That's great. Paul, that's awesome. I think that there's a lot. Definitely would like to see the whole slides, but uh, we're, we're approaching the end. And at the end, I always ask, um, it's not a question. It's more like a piece of advice. If you could, I mean, you've already said tons and tons <coughs> of things that could be taken as advice. Yeah. You know? uh, but um, you know that uh, um, teaching, uh, mainly in Brazil, you know the, the teaching context in Brazil, like we're always too busy, too hectic. Yeah. There's, there's a lot going on all the time. And would you mind giving us some piece of advice, you know, to, <laughs> if you could, to make <laughs> the teaching life easier? Well, I mean, it can be like uh, something, you know, obviously, like, uh, obviously try you know, reject international methodology, which ignores your students mother tongue, you know, insist, <laughs> insist to the publishers that they, what's interesting, I think, is that the publishers produce a host of specific books for Poland, which is about 40 million people, Sp uh, Greece, which is about 10 million people. Um, Except of Turkey, which is 80 million. They, they are very specific books for these markets, but they completely ignore in the main Latin America. We just, everything's dumped upon us. So I think we need to be more demanding and saying, you need to accommodate my students, not just a little glossary, not just an add on, but go back to the publisher and say, if you don't give me something more specific for my students, I'm going to have to look elsewhere. Because I think Latin America's had a very rough deal in terms of, you know, in my travels, I see the same book being used in four continents. And in the four continents, they do not use the same language that we do, which is so advantageous, Portuguese, for example. So that's one thing I think you know, demand more of the publishers because you know, they're making a lot of money on your back. And I think that's quite important. Wow. Um, I, I try to be... Aware, more aware of natural process. What you do yourself is probably what the students are doing. When you're looking at a text, you're going through Portuguese. Of course, you're drawing on your experience, but invite students to do the same as you. Reflect, be, be more honest about natural process. I'm not suggesting people are dishonest, but you know, we all know what happens. You don't, you don't think in English until at least C1. Yeah. And the vast majority of students are not C1. And an A1 student and a B1 student think in a very different way from each other, are very different creatures and need a very different diet. So, you know, horses for courses, if you like, is what I'm saying. You know, at each level, do what you think is most appropriate for the group that you have in front of you. Don't be, you know, we have to cover this because it's in the book. No, you don't. You know, you have to teach the people in front of you what you think is best next for them. Now, it's very difficult because programs are prescribed and tests are set. But I think horses for courses and courses for horses, whichever way you want to look at it, is actually the best thing. You know, you're never the same teacher at A1 as you are at B1. And if you are, then you need to look in the mirror. Whoa, okay, awesome. I think that this is with these <laughs> words. I offended every, <laughs> have I offended everybody by now? <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> but people will take the message uh, and they will reflect. Hopefully they will reflect upon those and kind of try to change something that is inside of them. Some people we know that they, uh, they are not allowed to change much because they, they work for companies that may not, you know, uh, give them room uh, for some things. But there are some bits that can be changed, right? There are some bits that can be uh, sure. introduced yeah i think uh, at, at least I mean, at the very least look look at the tra train students to use digital tools better outside the classroom mm -hmm. because at least that if you can't if it's you know, absolutely forbidden in your context then at least at the very least use translation digital tools etc 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 again that's a topic for another day but uh, as best you can outside the classroom so that the students are at least getting the complement of that natural process and seeing the wealth of resource which Portuguese can bring. They need to see all these words. What's really interesting is the higher you go in language learning, if you follow the, the standard native speaker frequency route, rather than facility, I, I choose to blend facility and frequency rather than just go for frequency, because frequency is a nonsense in terms of if you marry it with Portuguese. The other day I saw uh, what was the word? Federal is supposed to be a C1 word. I mean, that's just federal. Really, you're, you're not <laughs> supposed to introduce the word federal until C1. Yeah, what's the name of Brazil? <laughs> what's the full name? 
<laughs> there are. Federal... I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but these words are hidden because by criteria which are being imposed, you know, for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm getting lost in my thoughts here. What was I saying? <laughs> Oh, yes. uh, okay, yeah, but the frequency and the facility, yeah, like I yeah. mean, the, 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 that's the, the the thing that should go first, and and then uh, um, I think that's again compiled. frequency doesn't make like native speaker frequency is all very well if that's your target, but we're not trying to make create native speaker teachers. We're trying mm -hmm. to facilitate a an effective uh, bilingual cl a class for bilingual operatives who will switch between languages. Awesome. But that's inevitable. Well, we're talking about the people who are where it's prescribed, where you cannot use uh, the mother tongue. Just get them working with outside the class with all the digital resources they can. And you can bet your life that once they start to work with translation, they will meet more of the words. Ah, I just remember what I'm saying is very interesting. Students who do get to see one, who then go on to study academically science or law or computing or something so when they get to see one suddenly go whoa all these technical words are so similar there's so many words which are similar but these words have been hidden for years for students because they're being dragged through this native speaker frequency route and all i'm trying to do is bring down some of these words so you have access to a lot more expressivity much much sooner and i think that if if anything, I'd like that to be my impact on ELT, really, is just you know, allow students to access things which are easy for them much, much sooner, rather than just a, a narrow route, which we has been imposed upon us for re reasons which don't bear much scrutiny locally. Wow, that's that's just great. Yeah, this is, a, um, I believe it might take a while until people <laughs> fully realize that. <laughs> I've been banging my head against a wall for 20 years. <laughs> Uh, but just, uh, just you know, like uh, um, being able to talk to you and actually uh, making this talk available so that people watch it and see it, that uh, there is room for L1 wherever you are, wh whoever you are, yeah, that's going to be something, yeah. Uh, I'm <laughs> going to... <laughs> okay, could you, could you read that? Thank you so much. For aguantating me. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Uh, no, but I think that's my conclusion. You know, students uh -huh. make cross linguistic connections throughout their learning. You, know, you can't stop it. Let's in, we, let's encourage it as a strategy. You know, in a controlled manner. I'm not saying I haven't said at any point. Start speaking lots of Portuguese in the classroom. Absolutely not. I would argue that at least ninety percent of your class has to be in English, and at least eighty percent of the students has to be in English, but th there's room. We need to start thinking with numbers, you know, what, what is acceptable, you know, and what is what is realistic. I'm, I, 100% is, 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 you know, just unrealistic. So I, I was going to suggest something like 90, at least 90% of a teacher's class should be in English. 95, 98% arguably. 100% probably is slowing things down. Students, well, you can argue 80, you can argue 85, you can argue 90, but what about mutual support? What about peer teaching? What about all that? So my feeling is 80% between the students, 85, 90, at least up to B2 level, is pretty good. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I can be shot down for trying to put a number on it, but at some point we have to try and put some numbers on things so people have a clearer target. We are... We are number oriented, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we need those. We need those. Awesome. That that's awesome. Uh, I I believe that people can contact you. I mean, if they have any question on the materials here on the English ID, and actually oh. there is another question. Uh, what what are you working on uh, at the moment? I mean, is there anything coming up new in terms of publishing, in terms of articles? Uh no, I've, I've, I've written various articles to support this, which I'm happy to share with people. Mm -hmm. At the last LABSI, uh, uh, I was talking about, I think it's interesting, my very first talk ever was uh, in Brazil, was 1992, and it was called Not With My Mother's Tongue. <laughs> Not With My Mother's Tongue. And it was received um, eh, pretty well because it was fun, but people rejected most of the ideas. I gave the same talk in Argentina on the same tour. And they threw me out of the building because it, it's absolutely prohibited there. Oh I'm joking. But the re reaction wasn't very good. So the last lab scene from Minas Gerais, I gave 45 ways 
to use the mother tongue. So I'm, I'm working on more. I'm trying to put together. I think I, I, what I want. I'm trying to work on a, a scholarly article, which cost, <laughs> which I find difficult, about <laughs> linguistic. It's called linguistic empathy, because mm. I, I feel it's a term I've not come across very much, if at all. I googled it and it doesn't come up. Mm. So uh, I think maybe it's even something that you know perhaps I'm if you like, in the vanguard, I'm trying to create an article about linguistic empathy. What is linguistic empathy on the part of the teacher? That, to me, is uh, what most interests me. Which words can I choose which best facilitate my students' moment? Yeah. And you know, Because we have a lot of choices. We can use native speaker-like if we have that level of language. We can use you know, a, a, you know, a whole range of words. We can use Latinate forms, we can use complex, we, we, and I, just, I do think we need to be more aware of what's coming out of our own mouths in terms of what the students are getting. Of course they need to comprehend, but then what they can produce isn't at all at the same level. And I think that's what interests me, you know, horses for courses. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm dying to read your article whenever it's published and <laughs> finished. <laughs> uh, and I'd also love to schedule maybe uh, uh, when our schedules are freer and less busier, another meeting to actually, I kind of counted four different topics <laughs> for four different days. So who knows, going to have more Paul Salison uh, here in the, in the series. Uh, whereas I'm thinking of uh, creating uh, out of these sessions like a podcast, so people have requesting podcasts because there are some people that are, you know, like they can't of watch course. videos all the time, then they would be just listening to those. So this is something that may come up next year uh, as well. Uh, next year, just a few updates. Next year, I'm starting uh, in January with another uh, guest. Uh, probably are going to have like a Fernando Guarani. Yeah, uh, huh? with me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're gonna be talking about something that is still it's, it's still settling. It's on the way to be settled uh, by the end of this month, and then I'll have like the whole program for the semester uh, available uh, in the beginning of January. Okay, so who knows? We're gonna have your face again. Yeah, next year. So yeah. Well, I promise to wear a different shirt. <laughs> different, background. <laughs> different background yeah my background this background here actually i'm not in my office i'm using my daughter's room <laughs> today but yeah that's, that's how it is this that's is hiding it. my dirty laundry <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so guys thank you very much everyone and i hope you guys enjoyed this video and paul thank you very much for taking your some of your busy time yeah to be here with us Ciao, Jinch. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. Eh? Awesome. <laughs> okay. Bye. See you, everyone.